We're going to do a little bit of pediatrics, or a little pediatric heavy this year uh, to make up for some prior uh, omissions. But we went through the last about a year in the uh, emergency medical abstracts database and clustered some articles on peds, <clears throat> looking at some things that I think are maybe a little controversial. Like the first one is uh, sedation in kids. You need to have them NPO. What's the risk of sedating a kid who is not NPO? And, uh, you know, the anesthesiologist, anytime you have a procedure done in the hospital, <clears throat> they say uh, nothing after midnight. And you come in and your surgery it turns out to be 9, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. You're starving during that whole time and you're not having had any opportunity to eat anything. And what has occurred in your stomach during that time is your pH goes lower and lower and lower. And it gets into a critical range where uh, the fasting stomach pH is in the neighborhood of one to one and a half is the pH. Uh, if you aspirate any gastric contents with a pH less than two and a half, that's the pH which will dissolve lung tissue. So the idea is that we have created this in male you of hyperacidity in the stomach because people have been fasting. You know, you would think what they would say is, here, have a piece of pizza or something like that to, so that you don't deal with this uh, pH level. Because the three determinants of aspiration damage is the volume of stomach uh, contents, number one, whether you have particulates or not, and the, and the pH. We can change the pH rather quickly by saying, you know, if somebody's going to have some surgery, here, drink a couple of these ounces of Maalox, and, you know, pretty quickly your pH is going to change. So this idea of NPO after midnight is really not very contemporary. There's this idea of, you know, we don't want that pH being so low. Um, so in the kids' study, this is a study of 139,000 patient records, and during these are peed sedations through this thing they call the Pediatric Sedation Research Consortium of all things. 75 major adverse uh, events out of 139,000 cases. That's 0.05 percent, and um, there were no deaths. There were uh, a couple of 10 aspirations and. There were some uh, hospitalizations that, that were brief. They compared NPO kids and those who were not NPO. There's no difference, and in fact, there was no statistical difference between the outcomes in those cases. In fact, the numbers were slightly better if you were not NPO. Um, no significant association between NPO status and major adverse events. So the idea of, well, you know, I don't really feel comfortable sedating this kid because he had breakfast four hours ago kind of thing, or you know, some Cheetos, um, it doesn't seem to hold up. There may be some th theoretical reasons, and yeah, you don't want to have a stomach that's full of, you know, stuff that may get regurgitated, but this idea of NPO, you can't do anything, um, is really doesn't hold up. Huge study, 139,000 cases. Drugs of choice for sedation of kids. This is a study out of uh, Ottawa, 6,300 uh, pediatric sedations, and they compared adverse events with certain uh, drugs that were being used to see which is the safest drug to sedate a kid with. And um, they had a very liberal definition of adverse events, uh, like uh, a little hypoxia kind of thing, or you needed to bag them a little bit kind of thing. So they, the, the rate of serious adverse events, using their liberal definition, you know, like 1%. But the, but the real issue here is what were the drugs that, in terms of safety? Ketamine alone versus propofol alone, ketamine plus fentanyl, ketamine plus propofol. And by far, by far, the safest drug to use is ketamine alone. All this, prop, uh, you know, ketofol and all that other stuff, Ketamine alone, and in fact, the odds ratios for having an adverse event compared to ketamine alone, propofol, the odds ratio of having an adverse event was five, odds ratio was 5.6, five times greater than having it with ketamine alone. Um, ketamine plus fentanyl, six times greater. Ketamine plus propofol, four times greater. So stick with the nice, simple, straightforward ketamine kind of thing. It's used around the world uh, 
to do all kinds of things and don't mess with Mother Nature. What about intranasal midazolam for sedation of uh, little kitties? This next study says, listen, how much can we squirt in there before we start you know, having a, a, any kind of issues with regard to volume or eff effectiveness? So they compared uh, very little amounts, 0.2 mLs being shot up the nose, 0.5 mLs being shot up the nose, or 1 mL being shot up the nose. And um, the onset of action was similar, independent of the dilution. It was five minutes for midazolam. Uh, no significant differences in the uh, ratings of procedural distress. So I would have thought the kid would be more upset if you put a CC or something up their nose, but that, that wasn't the case. The time to uh, start the procedure, the uh, adverse events, the deepest level of sedation, and uh, the ratings of inadequate sedation by the doctors. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that all of them were equivalent. So in terms of how much you squared up, it doesn't seem to matter. The only issue was that the doctors had the most difficulty physically squirting up 0.2 mLs, because it's hardly anything kind of thing. Nitrous oxide is uh, the next paper. This is um, a study from Miami Children's Hospital. Now, I'm glad the Australians are here because, doctor, I, uh, I um, you use nitrous oxide? We do a lot, yes? Do you like it? Like, where's our other? Tell us about it. You got to tell us. You got to get. We're not, you're not a big fan, personally. You like ketamine. But ketamine, you got to start an IV. Nitrous oxide, you don't. That's one of the advantages. What do you think? We use a lot of ketamine, I think. The, 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 this, is a, this has been every year, year after year after year, we do these courses. The Aussies use it like uh, water, and we don't use it at all. Any of you use ketamine? I mean, uh, nitrous in your ERs. Are you uh, in the United States of America? Where, where would that be? Where, where are you? I travel. Phoenix? Yeah, they do. I used to carry them in London uh, as well. I went there a long, long time ago, and I saw ketamine in the... You know, the issue was, you know, the bottle was always empty. You must have had a valve leak or something like that, but because the staff was into it all the time. But um, you don't have to start an IV. Its effect is pretty much immediate. Now you can adjust how much concentration you were giving. Before it was fixed to 50-50. Now you can give 70-30, 70 70% 30, 70 nitrous, 30% oxygen. That's more than enough oxygen. We only need 21%, and we're going to give you 30 kind of thing. So you can't have an issue there. And uh, in this study, which was 1,000 kids who got it in, at the uh, Miami Children's Hospital, surprisingly, they didn't use uh, concentrations much over 50%. And in the United States, when we were using it, we thought, you know, it's just not that potent kind of thing. And so the idea of being able to turn it up to 70% was that was very cool. Um, 1.8% minor complications. 1.8% minor. Unre it was unrelated to the ASA classification of the kid or the fasting status. There's another one of those fasting things. Unrelated to the uh, maximum nitrous oxide concentration. It was, if it was 70%, that wasn't related. It was related to the duration of the procedure and the levels of sedation that you ultimately got to. Um, in fact, in this study, vomiting was more common in kids who were fasting. So this is kind of like, and every year we talk about this, and every year the uh, number of people who use it is the same, and I just don't understand it, because we're into the sedation of kids all the time now. There's no more brutane kind of thing, and yet here it is. You know, you, they use it at the dentist's office, are crying out loud. You know, what do they know about the intubation and, uh, you know, sedation? They got to put a little pig nose on you and go out to La La Land while they brush your teeth, for crying out loud. Uh, ketamine versus uh, nitrous for lacerations. Well, that's a good one. Uh, that's a Korean study. It's a very small study, 32 kids. No statistical difference was uh, seen between satisfaction reported by the physician, nurse, or parents regarding the range of uh, 
satisfaction for, through this thing. Although, I must admit, the ketamine seemed to have a little edge because there were some doctors who really weren't too fond of the nitrous. And there was a lot of doctors who were, but the average turned out to be a little bit less maybe on the uh, nitrous side. A longer total duration of sedation, you bet. I mean, uh, you give somebody ketamine and they have to watch them wake up and all that other thing. That was 20 minutes for them to wake up compared to basically nothing for the nitrous. Most adverse events were with ketamine, as you may have envisioned, and uh, there was no need to start an IV. So next year, please come back and say, yeah, we got it, we tried it. And I went to the ASAP Scientific Assembly, and they had a, a booth, and one of the uh, exhibitors was a booth of nitrous oxide. And I was like, uh, I went to this la lady and said, why, why can't we get this into our emergency departments? And she just scratched her head because she didn't understand the source of resistance. And I think it's not really resistance. I think it's inertia. I mean, if you asked, listen, we'd like to get that stuff down in the emergency department, this nitrous oxide. You know, they're not going to give you a hard time with it. The anesthesiologist is going to say something about it. You know, you, you're, you're giving propofol. You're giving Michael Jackson drug to put people to sleep. You know, they, they went nuts over that. So their, their days of going nuts are, are, are gone. And now these machines have scavengers. So you're not bending this into the, the department, which is one of the issues when we were using it in the 70s and 80s, because that was, so that's not a problem anymore. So I just don't get it. Anybody have an idea why this isn't uh, accepted in this country? Why is that? Oh, the night staff would abuse it. Not the day staff. <laughs> the night staff. You know the night staff. You know, they're all wild, uh, ca you know, loose cannons. They don't want to be around any of the administrative staff that's there during the day. That's a poor excuse. Poor, look at the opportunity to, to, to treat kids much more humanely by using this rather than starting an IV. Starting an IV... My four-year-old, when, when he was two, he got a shovel full of sand in his eye, and we were at the beach in, uh, in Virginia. And we went to an emergency department, and this, this, was, this kid was a two-year-old with a ton of sand in his eye. We went to the local ER. They said, oh, we can't do this. We're going to send you to the uh, pediatric ER. This thing took six hours. They gave him ketamine there. He zombied out. But the real, the real whole issue was, Man, I hope that they, they can start an IV in his kids. His kids, you know, two and a half. Starting an IV in a kid two and a half is maybe not that easy. Yeah. And now you don't have to do it. Let's, you know, come on. Um, number six says nitrous oxide is great. It's a commentary. European Society of Anesthesiologists. Properly trained non-anesthesiologists, that's us, can safely administer nitrous oxide for the indication of uh, sedation in adults and children. There is no evidence regarding efficacy or safety that precludes the use of nitrous oxide. Even the Europeans say we can do it. Switching over to a little bit on asthma management. Number seven is about cookbook medicine. Cookbook medicine. As soon as you say that, you know the phrases. I'm not doing you know, this cookbook medicine. You know, most of you came here in an airplane. They do a thing called an airplane called cookbook flying. You know, it's called a check sheet. You want them to use the check sheet kind of thing when they take off? Everybody would like them to use the check sheet. That's called cookbook flying. You know, that pilot's taken that plane off 2,000 times. Why don't you just say, come on, you know, we trust you. Just take a plane off. You know, don't, don't bother with the check sheet. Who's going to say that? Nobody. Even the pilot uses the check sheet because he's in the plane. He's going to be the first to hit the ground. And all those people behind him is going to be on top of him. Number seven, this is from a, a, this is a before and after study. They, um, these are looking at moderate to severe exacerbations, 21-year-old and younger. I think it's ridiculous when these pediatricians still say a 21-year-old is a kid, for crying out loud. You know, it's just, uh, you know, you see these studies. Well, we looked at gastroenteritis, and we, the, the, uh, we looked at kids, people from six months old to 21-year-old. You can't, that's, a, that's not apples and apples. But in any case, this is, um, the, this pathway is, was based on the uh, National Institute of Health asthma guidelines. 
379 uh, people with the pathway versus 870 historical controls where they did not use the pathway. The rates of cortisol treatment within one hour, 45% after induction of the uh, introduction of the pathway versus 18% when they didn't have a pathway. So they got their steroids a lot faster um, than not. Although steroids really don't act that quickly, it could be a surrogate marker of, well, you know, they were pretty, pretty good at treating these patients. Um, more patients overall received steroids in the uh, patients group that was the pathway. 96% of the people who, uh, followed, uh, who were treated with the pathway got steroids, uh, 79%, 78% who did not. More patients on the clinical pathway received a bronchodilator within an hour they're there with asthma. It takes them an hour to get a bronchodilator. Yeah, 36% with the pathway got a bronchodilator within an hour. Well, you know that registration process takes a while, you know. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to verify all the, the cards and things like that. We've got to, and we do have to measure the head circumference of the, and, you know, and that, no, by the way, we will get to your uh, bronchodilator, but we'll, we'll give us time, you know. It's unbelievable. And the people who don't use the pathway, it took only a quarter of the patients got a, 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 a bronchodilator within an hour. Fewer chest x-rays, 27% with the pathway, 42% without the pathway. Should be more, more like 5% with uh, than 27%. Fewer required hospital admission. Now, this is pretty cool. 21% versus 13%. You don't use the pathway, 21% are going to get admitted. You use the pathway, 13% get admitted. Kearney, that's kind of like the, the uh, you know, the, the big, 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 uh, big ending here. So, yeah, cookbook medicine worked in this case. Um, it works probably in most cases. IV magnesium, we talked about that. I don't think we need to kind of uh, get into that uh, anymore. I think the key thing there is this concept of the severity of the d disease is a determinant of how the therapy of some, uh, your therapy can, can work. So this is a Cochrane report. Um, IV magnesium led to reduced hospital admissions in adults. And in the pediatric review that they did, the Cochrane analysis, uh, five randomized double-blind trials, placebo-controlled trials, 182 kids. That's five trials, 182 kids. Whenever you see five trials, 182 kids, that's like 30, 30 or 35 kids in a trial. Uh, so... Um, there's a lot of opportunity to kind of basically say uh, uh, errors in this trial, errors in that trial, problems in this trial. You had five weak, you know, small trials, and you only get a total of 182. It's going to be able to be difficult to show powerfully that there uh, things make a difference. And then, anyway, in these five trials, it came up to 182 kids. 89 received mag sulfate and 93 received placebo. The odds of a hospital admission were 60% lower in patients who got IV mag sulfate. And, this, and we're talking about all the, the bad kids, the kids who may come into the hospital. Mag seemed to make a difference in terms of adults and kids when your back's to the wall. Not the routine minor, minor cases that get better on, you know, a few puffs of their, their albuterol inhaler. Uh, inhaled steroids in asthma is... Uh, uh, number nine, Texas Children's Hospital. Of 71 kids receiving a prescription for inhaled steroids, only 53% refill, uh, filled that prescription. And that's kind of, a, you know, a, may be a duplicate of the paper of yesterday, but the point is, is that we used to think asthma was, well, you, your treatment was the al al albuterol puffer, and if that wasn't doing good enough, we'd throw in some steroids. And then they flipped it. Now the treatment is you're on steroids, and then if you're not doing well, you get onto your puffer. But the puffers cost too much, and um, $220. And so people are, are not getting their prescriptions filled, is what this basically says. The number, what number is that? Number 10 is the one we did yesterday on dexa, dexamethasone on discharge. Uh, I think also the uh, number 11 was done uh, yesterday. This is about the uh, huge number of otitis media kids who were getting broad-spectrum antibiotics. No, no improvement in terms of outcome, 
uh, more, uh, more problems with regards to the side effects when you gave augmentin for ear infections and, and uh, the uh, macrolides, the albuterol, I mean the, um, uh, the, the famous z pack which is considered a broad-spectrum antibiotic by these guys. Um, and antibiotics for outpatient pneumonia is number 12. This is a uh, study of 717 kids determined that the, uh, be below the age of seven, uh, six, month, six years, pardon me, uh, giving them simple monotherapy with the beta-lactam is all they needed. After the age of six, they needed uh, beta-lactam and a, um, and a uh, macrolide. You know, it's kind of interesting because the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America came out with these guidelines for the treatment of pneumonia that said if you're going to come into the hospital with pneumonia, you're going to get a shot of cetriaxone and you're going to get um, uh, an azithromycin. So there was two for adults. Well, this said kids for over six did better when they had two antibiotics rather than one, but that kids six and under actually did just as well with just getting them a single antibiotic, where basically you have less risk of, of um, you know, diarrhea, and especially when you're giving something like uh, augmentin, uh, amoxicillin clavulanate, which is at the top of the list of diarrhea-conducing antibiotics. So, uh, skin and soft tissue infections in kitties, um, the value of ultrasound, uh, I think that there are two major advances in the treatment of skin and soft tissue infections in the last maybe five years. There's these papers that come out that say, you know, I have to tell you the truth, when you lance and I, uh, a boil, that they do a little bit better if you give them some uh, Bactrim. You see those papers, New England Journal, Dave Talon paper, and uh, it was like, wow, we were told you don't need antibiotics if you just lance uh, abscesses. And, and people saw this and said, geez, I knew it all along. You should have been doing that. But the fact is, it, it is that when you start looking at those papers, the number to treat, the number of people who need to be given antibiotics is in the neighborhood between, depending on what study you look at, between one, in, one in, out of eight or one out of 14. So certainly the vast majority of people you give antibiotics to after you lance that abscess, they're going to get no benefit out of it, but they are subject to the side effects associated with it. So it basically still says you don't have to necessarily do this in a knee-jerk manner now that we're writing back to prescriptions for everybody who's boil you lanced. And the other uh, major um, improvement in care related to ultrasound to determine whether there was pus in that abscess that you thought was ready to be drained and turns out not to be ready. Because I've had my uh, share of well, let's let the evil humors out here, and we make this cut here, and nothing comes out. And maybe I didn't go deep enough, and let me go deeper and wider and kind of thing. And it really just wasn't there, and it wasn't ready. And so these guys are talking about using ultrasound to ascertain whether there's some pus in there, which then you would go after it, and whether there wasn't. So this is a review of a systematic review and meta-analysis, a number 13, three adult studies, uh, and then when they used ultrasound to determine whether there was pus in there, the, it changed treatment depending on the study. What, there were three of them. One changed treatment in 17% of the cases, and another changed treatment in 56% of the cases. 56%, they they they, what they were going to do was change because of looking a little jelly on the wound, you know, skin. And my understanding is that you know this is... Pretty easy to learn. The five pediatric studies found that, that um, ultrasound change management in between 4 and 27 percent of the cases, depending on what study you read. So I think that this is a substantial number where the treatment is changed based on uh, ultrasound, ascertaining whether there's a pus pocket that's drainable or not. And it seems that this should be a practice changer uh, in your environment because of the large magnitude of patients whose therapy was changed, whether it be an adult or a kid. Wrist injuries. This is a little uh, wacky one. I just threw it in, in here for wackiness. Uh, it's 14. This is from Penn State. 101 children with wrist symptoms 
who had an MRI, and, a, and most of them had a plain x-ray. You can't get an MRI without getting a plain x-ray. That's a, the ticket to the MRI is the plain x-ray ticket, you know. Even though you, you know that that's not really what you wanted in the first place. Um, in this study, Penn State, reliable kind of place, MRIs changed the diagnosis in half the cases, 46%, and a change in therapy in 86% of the cases of the kids who had wrist issues who got an MRI in terms of what was wrong with them. Now, I'm just suggesting to do, to do this. That what were the diagnoses that they found? Well, some of them were not really super traumatic. They were just kind of painful, something going on. 22 of them had a wrist ganglion. 19 had a bone contusion. I don't know what the treatment of changes for a bone contusion is. And 10 of them had fractures that were not seen on plain x-rays. So this, this, the only point about this is that MRI tells you a lot more information that you may, want to, that you may not want to know. Uh, I personally, as a, just a personal kind of thing here, people talk about, uh, you know, the snuff box injuries. And the old way I used to treat those was, well, you know, I feel pain in the stuff box, tenderness there on the palm, the outstretched hand. It's like, and the x-ray looks okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you a, a thumb spike a cast so you don't move your thumb around. And you come back in two weeks, and we're going to take another x-ray to see whether, in fact, that fracture that you may or may not have has signs now of a healing fracture. Well, you know, I'm not interested in having a, ca you know, a splint put on my wrist for two weeks. I'm not interested in that. Um, why would you not get an MRI? What is your time worth? You know how much Medicare pays for an MRI? Virtually nothing. Because they're, that's what they're worth. Virtually nothing in terms of, you know, they're not $2,000. And I would know right then and there, the plain x-ray was negative. I have a high clinical index of suspicion. I'm going to get the right test. And the right test is, we're going to send you back for an MRI. And it's going to say yes or no. And if it's no, you're out of here. And if it's yes, we, we got it. And then we'll put you in an aristomobilizer and send you to the send it to the orthopedist. Now, I know a lot of people don't agree with that. They want to go with the 1970s version of that. But that machine is right down the hall. It will tell you the answer. And you, if you're working clinically, you're, at, you're, not, how, you're going to be able to suture with that thing? No, I don't think so. Um, you, you take a, an x-ray, the joint above and the joint below. You know, when you, wasn't that the kind of the mantra if you were going to, uh, an orthopedist would do joint above, joint below? Well, this basically says, you know, you really don't need to do that if you do something else called a physical examination. If you do a physical examination, you don't need to do that. Um, this, is a, this is a study where I don't want to get into the woods in this, but bottom line is, is that, yeah, there were some kids where they x-rayed the elbow, uh, the, the wrist, and ultimately when they did the, uh, did the whole kit and caboodle, this, this, this is where the fracture was. But the but the issue was, had, did you do an adequate examination? And when, the, when an examination was done up both joints, there was no necessity to do the joint above and the joint below uh, mantra anymore. And the last paper here says, splinting is as good as casting for uh, stable buccal fractures. You know, what may be bu uh, equally good for stable buccal fractures is nothing, but... Certainly, you don't need to put a cast on these. So says this British um, uh, paper, eight randomized controlled trials. And lastly, you, do orthopedists ever say, don't give them any NSAIDs if they have a fracture? You ever, you know, because NSAIDs inhibit inflammation. Inflammation is a part of the healing of a fracture kind of thing. So you can, you can uh, show them this paper. Uh, you might have to read it to them. Uh, this is a huge, ret no, it's a retrospective, it's not double blind. 808 kids, though, who had fractures that were thought prone, thought prone to healing complications. And um, some were, the record said they were given ibuprofen, and the other said the record they were not given ibuprofen. It's certainly not, we don't know whether they actually got it, we don't know whether they actually took it, so it's not a great study in that regard. But the uh, incidence of bone healing complications was 3% with ibuprofen and 3% if if there was no record that you had taken it. But this study is able to be shot full of holes. And there's always these physiologic arguments. This is a physiologic argument. 
Inhibiting inflammation will, uh, will, will not let your bone heal well because you need inflammation to heal it. So we have a lot of things that we do that were based on physiologic uh, arguments that turn out not to be true. It's logical, but it just doesn't, it's not the, not the answer. So Jim, are you up here, my friend? Let's go.